So turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9 today. Revelation chapter 9. I want to say this to preface the message. If you want your soul to be well, not just in life here, but for eternity, if you want your soul to be well, we need to know Christ. Christ makes all things well and good. And that, um, that leads us into our time today in the Word. A, a very difficult subject. Um, I honestly uh, preach this text with, with great humility um, because we're, gonna, we're getting into the, the toughest part of the book when the wrath of the Lord is more severe, the judgment of God more intense than we've ever seen. And so um, as, we, as we go into this time in the Word over these next few weeks, uh, just be very prayerful. Um, understand that for the believer in Christ, we live in the hope of the gospel. Um, and we should, want, we should want others who don't know Christ to know Him before this happens. Okay, so in Revelation 9 today, the name of the message is called Hell Unleashed. Now, I kind of is anybody excited about this message today? Uh, uh, it's tough, it's tough, um, but today's message is called "Hell Unleashed." So there were four preachers. They were sitting on a park bench as they were taking a break from their heavy schedules. You know this is going to be a bad joke <laughs> as it begins, it begins with four preachers. But they're enjoying each other's company and fellowship. It was a, a nice, cool fall day. And as they were talking, a, uh, a, a man spoke up, one of the preachers. He said, you know, since we're all such good friends, since we're all such good friends, I think this might be a good time for us to discuss some of the problems that we're going through. You know, just as preachers, and they all nodded in agreement. They said, yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll share some things. And one just lifts his hands up and he says, well, you know what? I'd, I'd like to share with you the fact that I have an ongoing struggle with addiction. Sometimes, sometimes I give in to excess to, uh, to different things. And all the other preachers heard this man share his story, and they all started to gasp. So everybody gasped. <gasps> this is a preacher. <laughs> Y'all did really good with that. <laughs> There'll be other chances. The second, the second preacher spoke up, and he said, you know, since you were so honest, I, I would just like to say that I, that I have a struggle. My problem is gambling. It's terrible. <laughs> It's so terrible that, that, I, that I even, uh, I'm so addicted to money that I cheat on my taxes. And another gasp was heard. Go ahead. You know what to do. <laughs> Y'all are really getting good at this. The third preacher, he speaks up and he says, you know what? Since you're all being honest, so will I. I'm really troubled, guys, because I'm having a, I'm having a hard time not looking at some of the pretty women that come to our church. And the temptation is there all the time. Everybody start, really started gasping then. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> After a few more minutes, the fourth, the fourth preacher, he won't say anything. He just remains silent. And, and everybody's encouraging him. Tell your story. Tell, tell your secrets. We want to know how we can encourage you. And, and, and so you could tell he's really struggling. And finally he just said, well, the fact is, guys, I don't, I don't know how to tell you my problem. And everybody's like, oh, it's all right, brother. Your secret's safe with us. Well, <laughs> said the fourth preacher, you see, I'm an incurable gossip. I can't keep a secret. <laughs> I want to ask you, by show of hands today, how many of you are good at keeping secrets? Be honest. <laughs> oh, okay. Just, okay. How many of us are good at keeping secrets? Now, we're nosy people by nature. Isn't it tempting, folks, when, when, when you hear someone say, don't tell anyone? You know, you, you heard somebody you might be passing by, maybe in a restaurant or at school, or, you know, you're like, don't, you hear somebody say those words, don't tell anybody about this. Isn't it like tempting to get closer <laughs> and, and, you know, try to just to, to hear what they're talking about. You know, we, we, we want to hear those things. And how many of you have ever been entrusted with a secret before? Yeah. How many of you actually keep the secret that's told to you? All right. All right. So we like to get inside information. You see it all the time with the news. You know, they put up this news flash and they say breaking news and then the tabloids. Well, they're really good at gossiping. So they, they write their, they write their columns, but they like to say the same thing. Breaking news on this person's relationship or that one. Okay. We like to get inside information. Well, what if I told you, what if I told you that God has the scoop? 
God has the, the secret, so to speak, of all that is going on in the world around us. God has all the inside information of all the things that are going to happen to us. God has revealed to us in his word the secret things of heaven and eternity. If you read Psalm 25, verse 14, it says, The secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. And I, and I think that some of those secret things are found right here in Revelation. Now, to the lost person, okay? Now, I've got to be careful. I'm, trying, I'm working on this, all right? I'm working on this because the, most, most people don't know our church language. But when I say that to the lost person, I'm not talking about directionally lost. I'm not talking about a lost person. I'm talking about somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. So if there's someone that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, much of what is to come, we're looking in the book of Revelation, much of what is going to happen, if not everything that's going to happen, to them it looks like a big secret that's being kept from them. Think about that. The lost person, the unsaved person, does not understand the Word of God or the things of God or the purposes of God. And, and, and maybe, you know what, maybe they do. Maybe they feel like that the future is just is a mystery. The future is a big secret. And, and, and you know what, why, why would it be a big secret to them? Well, I'm thinking to the church, on the church's side, it's not a secret to us. We do, we do know of what's going to happen. We do know the secret things of God, the things that are to come here in his word. And, and the thing is, when, when we're at this place in Scripture, Revelation chapter 9, when we get to this place in Scripture, you have to remember the church is not present. The church has been raptured. The church has been removed from the earth before all these terrible things that we are reading about are going to happen. Seriously, folks, all of hell is going to be unleashed as God brings forth judgment to the world that does not know him or that the world that has rejected him. And this time, when the church is removed from the earth, God's going to bring his judgment in a period called the Great Tribulation. Everybody say the Great Tribulation. Now, the Tribulation period is seven years. In the last three and a half years or so, God is going to bring his wrath on the earth through different measures. And I hope that you've noticed this as we've been studying this, this, this book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. The judgments intensify. Okay, in chapter 6, we read about the worthy lamb, Jesus Christ, opening up seven seals that are on one single scroll. And these seven seals, as they're open, kicks off the tribulation that is to come. Those seven seals, though, give way. They give way to greater judgment. So last week, we were in chapter 8, and we talked about the trumpet judgments. And so there are seven trumpet judgments. Now, we talked about the first four trumpets in chapter 8. The first four trumpets were pretty rough judgments on the earth. We, we talked about them more in depth last Sunday night, but we're talking about the Lord wiping out major portions of the earth's vegetation and grass and trees much of the seas turned into blood, and, and all the sea, the sea creatures that are in the sea, uh, they, they're, they're killed. Fresh waters are made bitter. Okay, so God is bringing devastation onto the earth during this tribulation period. Remember, it's all coming to an end, all right? And as we read about those trumpet judgments, we read that God literally turns out the lights. A third of the sun, the moon, and the stars go out. The earth itself is off its axis, so to speak. Everything becomes chaotic when we head into chapter 9. Now, we think when we read about these things that are going to happen to the earth, we think that, that is terrible, and it is. But as we get further into chapter 9, we realize that it gets much worse. So we close chapter 8. We read that an angel, some translations say an eagle. It's the idea, though, that, that this, this angel or this eagle is flying around waiting to devour the spoils. Now, you, you've seen how vultures do. We live in the country. Okay, you see how they do. They, you, they, they fly around in circles, don't they? Looking, looking, okay, for, for food. And, 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 or maybe to spot prey, or maybe spot something that has died. And, and this angel or this eagle sends out a woe three times. We read that at the very end of chapter 8. And three times the angel or the eagle says, woe. And, and listen, I think I made a mistake last Sunday night in explaining this, so my apologies. But those three woes are warnings of judgment. 
So the eagle is, is giving a caution. The angel is giving a warning, so to speak, about the coming condemnation and judgment that is about to come upon the earth. And so this is what the angel or the eagle is saying to the earth. Something terrible, something bad, something evil is about to happen. Literal hell is about to be unleashed on the earth. And Satan's fixing to have rain <laughs> Satan's fixing to open up an attack on the earth, and he's going to have some liberty to do so. Now, this should not surprise you, folks, to read that Satan is going to have some type of Rome or reign or rule during this time. We know that Satan has, has been trying to wage war and have victory over the Lord Jesus and his people since time began. So, so when we read about uh, Satan having this, this, this time on the earth, we, we shouldn't be surprised by that because that's what he's always ever done. Think about it, folks. I mean, think about from the beginning. He, he tried to launch attacks on the human race and tried to get them to rebel against God in disobedience in the days of Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. That, think about what he has tried to do. He, he starts by tempting the first humans, Adam and Eve, and then he moved on to more human beings like Cain or women in Genesis chapter 6. I mean, you can't forget about that. Satan tries to create this demonic hybrid human race to take over, and that's when God judged the world in Genesis 6 through, through the flood. And, and think about this. It goes further. Satan starts tormenting God's servants like, like Job, literally stripping Job of, of, of everything from his possessions to his children to his health, even turned his own wife against him. Okay, but it doesn't stop there. Satan has always attacked against the nation Israel. From, from their inception, I mean, he, he has constantly tried to lure the people of God into idolatry, immorality, uh, disobedience, fear, the worst, unbelief. And then, of course, Satan was at war with Jesus when Jesus walked the earth. Think about it, before Jesus ever even started his public ministry, Satan takes, uh, Jesus is tempted, uh, tempted 40 days and uh, 40 nights as he's fasting in the wilderness. He tempts Jesus at the start of his ministry. He, te he tempts Jesus throughout his ministry and he begins to influence like the, the religious leaders uh, of their day. I mean, just to try and discourage him. And eventually they, they, ended up, they ended up killing him. Not to mention Satan's influence on the 12 disciples and, and the start of the church. So over time, over history, Satan has waged war against the church. Now, we're living in the 21st century. Isn't that true? <laughs> from, from, from the time of the Apostle Paul to the time of Peter up to this day, Satan has went after the church, hasn't he? Think about this. Uh, I, I, I really believe this. I believe Satan hates Midway. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I believe that. Um, uh, Satan, Satan knows the address. <laughs> he, he knows the phone number. <laughs> He's not going to win, though, right? <laughs> He'll never win. Satan tries to distract the church. Satan tries to distance the church. Tra Satan tries to discourage the church, but he can't defeat us as long as King Jesus is on the throne. Okay. We have hope in the gospel. But Satan, Satan will do anything to destroy the credibility and integrity of a fellowship, whether it be by bad example or by flaw or sin or by trapping us into temptation, by getting us to compromise our faith, our beliefs, our convictions. Maybe, maybe Satan wants to control our tongues or attitudes or get us to fight the wrong battles against flesh and blood, which, which we're, we're really good at doing that by nature. Uh, but Satan wants to cause division. Satan wants to attack the family of God, whatever it takes. He's fighting against us, and he's not going to let up. So it shouldn't surprise you that as we go into chapter 9, Satan is about to try and take a central role in this story. He's going to be used in God's plan and purpose to launch an attack on the human race. And that attack is about to be read here in chapter 9. Now, things are changing here in the book of Revelation. For thousands upon thousands of years... The heavens have been declaring the glory of God. The heavens have been declaring the goodness of God. The, the heavens have been, have been basking in the graciousness of God. But now at this point in the book, the heavens are now declaring the righteous wrath of God. 
Things have changed. And, and in this chapter, this is the most intense warfare that could ever be unleashed on the earth. God is going to unleash hell for a season on this earth in the middle of the great tribulation. Now, some of you are having trouble, and I have as well, with the timing of these events. You know, like, when exactly is this going to happen, or when is that going to happen? I know that I do, and I have difficulty trying to determine when all of these things are going to take place. I mean, people have tried to map it out, and, and you know what? To be honest, I don't think we should get caught up in exactly when this is going to happen, and when this is going to happen. It, that, it's too difficult to tell, but we need to know that there's going to be a time in the great tribulation where Satan gets an opportunity to wreak havoc on this world. Now, before we even begin with the text, this should concern every single person in this room. All right? To be honest, this text aggravates the fire out of me because, because I hate Satan's guts. <laughs> okay? Uh, you, you should as well, uh, but, but, I, but I can't imagine what it's going to be like when he unlatches the gates of hell and releases out these attacks. But I don't want you to forget this, though. I don't want you to forget this. There's never been a moment in this book, and there's never been a moment in your life where God has left the scene and released us from his care or concern and gave sole authority to the devil. So as we're reading this book, and you might get the temptation to think that Satan's in charge, never is he in charge. God is over all of these events that are happening in his word. So what we're going to do is um, uh, we're, we're going we're to mind time, and we're going to go through the, verse, the first six verses of chapter 9. Tonight we'll follow up by finishing this chapter together. But there's a couple of things today I want you to notice when hell is unleashed. Let's read here. Chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him, notice that the star, the star is a person. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace and so the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. We're talking about now the 144,000 witnesses on the earth and those who have been saved. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. So when hell is unleashed, this first thing I want you to get is that a pit will be open. When hell is unleashed, a pit will be open. We see this in verses 1 through 2. Now, I know that for some people in our society today, some people do not believe in a literal hell, being a literal place of torment for those who don't know Christ. Some people believe that. I don't. You shouldn't. The, the late great preacher, D.L. Moody, once recalled a man coming to him and said, I like your preaching. And this is what he told him. And D.L. Moody was a great preacher, by the way. He says, I like your preaching. You don't preach hell, and I suppose you don't believe in one. <laughs> D.L. Moody said in response, I do not want to rise up in the judgment and say I was not a faithful preacher of the Word of God. It's my duty to preach all of God's Word just as He gives it to me. I have no right to pick out a text and there and say, I don't believe that. If I throw out one text, I must throw out all the texts. For in the same Bible I read of rewards and punishments, I read of heaven and hell. Listen, folks, hell is for real, too. Now, now some people don't believe that. Some people like the idea that only God is loving, but they do not like the idea or the reality of a God sending people into hell to, to be punished. Sure, they may be willing to believe. Now, if you ask those same people, they say they don't believe in a hell, but you ask them, well, where do you think, where do you think that Hitler went? Or where do you think that bin Laden went? Or where do you think that the members of ISIS would go? People would say, oh, they're in hell. But you just said you didn't believe in hell. So here's what we do. We think that hell is a great place for our enemies, but not a great place for us. So we choose not to believe in it. 
As J.I. Packer once said, an endless hell can no more be removed from the New Testament than an endless heaven can. Think about this song. John Lennon wrote a song back in the day. He penned these words. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy for you to try. No hell below us, above, or no hell below us, or heaven above us, only sky. You can imagine if you want to imagine. It doesn't take away the reality that there is a hell. <laughs> And I think it's a, I, I, don't, I don't think that, I don't think that um, uh, it's a state of mind. <laughs> I don't think that hell is a myth. <laughs> I don't think that you can do away with the fact that Scripture records more about hell <laughs> than it does about heaven. Jesus spent the majority of his time talking about the judgment of God. This is why we must do everything that we can to tell others about the love of Christ about the grace that is found in Jesus so that they won't be found in hell. You do get a great preview, though, of what hell is like um, in the Great Tribulation. As horrible as that may be, it's only temporary, <laughs> okay? Because hell itself will be permanent. Hell itself is going to be a lot worse. And, and, and think about this. Hell itself is not going to last five months. Hell itself is going to last forever. And, and, and you know what? It's not for debate. It is what the Word says, Okay, when we get to this uh, fifth trumpet, it blows in this tribulation period, and we read that a pit is unlocked. Literally, that, that word means a pit of the abyss, a bottomless pit, and it's unlocked by somebody who has been given the key. Now, who could this be? Who will be given the key? We read about a star falling from heaven. Now, we've already read about things falling from heaven in the first parts of Revelation, chapter 6, chapter 8. You're going to read about more in chapter 10. But this star is not an inanimate object. This star is an angelic being. This star is Satan himself. Now, I think it's very fitting. I think it's very fitting that the Bible would call Satan a star. When we think about stars, we think about people. Think about that, all right? We think about a celebrity. We think about those who are famous. We, we think about uh, the ultimate stars receiving the Super Bowl. The ultimate stars receive the Grammys. The ultimate stars re receive an Oscar or they have their name on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And what do they get? They get a star on, on the Walk of Fame. And, and in a very real sense, Satan is a star. He is known in all three worlds, heaven, hell, and earth. But he is a fallen star. And that tells us of his true identity. Now, Satan is a fallen angel. If you didn't know that, now you do. Satan once belonged to, to, the, to the angels and to the Lord in heaven. Satan once belonged as a, an exalted archangel. He was a worship leader, for crying out loud. He, he, uh, he, but he was not content. <laughs> Satan was not content with submitting to God in heaven. He was not content with who God made him to be. And, and so Satan wanted to be God. Satan wanted to take over heaven. We read about that in Isaiah 14. You can read about Satan literally falling from heaven in Isaiah 14 and in Ezekiel chapter 28. But Satan being cast out of heaven, we also learn that a third of the angels were cast out of, out of heaven too. There's a big church split in heaven. All right, and, and Satan, Satan today has access to the earth, but you also need to know that Satan has access to heaven as well, where Satan spends most of his time. A lot of people say Satan's attacking me, Satan's attacking me. Satan's not omnipresent. Satan's up in heaven, wasting time, accusing you and me of our faith in Jesus Christ. That, that's exactly what he did. He, he's an accuser. Okay, but Satan still has access to God's presence in heaven, but Satan also has demons. <laughs> Satan has other fallen angels that he sends out. <laughs> and during this time, this great tribulation, Satan is going to try one last time to assemble his demons for battle. And we read that God, for a season, gives Satan the keys to the bottomless pit. And this is a pit of punishment, folks. This is the pit of hell, and it's a horrible place, okay? We read about, just briefly, we read about it in verses 1 and 2, but, but it says, he opened, verse 2, he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit where there's smoke, there is fire. Keep that in mind. Like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of that pit. It's a deep place. 
Hell is a dark place. Hell is a disturbing place. Don't want to leave this one out. Hell is a demonic place. And in that pit are these fallen angels. You know what? Uh, uh, Studies have shown that that uh, that these angels are actually incarcerated demons. These are the strongest of demons, the most vile of demons. And these demons are literally being held in eternal bond waiting for the final judgment to come. This is an abyss where the most wicked and most perverted and most vile of all the angels are fallen. Jesus used the word Gehenna in Greek to describe uh, uh, the place of, 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 of hell when he was talking with his disciples for people. But the word Tartarus is the word used to describe the abyss. And it's only mentioned seven times in Revelation, and each time the word is used, it's talking about the most intense part of hell that you could possibly be in, the most severe torment and isolation. And these demons, these fallen angels, are are there incarcerated. Jude described them as incarcerated, as angels who did not keep their domain, but abandoned their proper abode. So Jude, in the book of Jude, Jude mentions how these, these angels would not keep their place in heaven. They would not stay where they're supposed to be. Yet God has cast them, God has cast them into their proper abode. And God has kept them in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. But here's the thing about Revelation 9. Satan is given the key to the abyss. And he's given permission to unlock and release the inmates of hell. Now I want you to picture what this would be like. So let's think about it in our day. What if the world decided... Let's say the the ruling authorities decided that we were just going to open all the doors of all the prisons and all the jails of the earth and set free the world's most vicious and violent people, giving them free reign to do whatever they pleased on the earth. How do you think the world would would respond to that? (gasps) We'd gasp, but we'd do more than gasp. (laughs) It'd It'd be terrible. Now, we shiver at the thought of that ever happening, that somebody would say, open up all the prisons and let all of, all of the inmates out, the most vicious and violent people. We shiver at that thought, but in Revelation chapter 9, I promise you, something worse, something worse is about to happen. Satan, who is cast out of heaven and is now given permission on the earth to gather up his demonic agents, he's got the worst that he could ever have, and he's going to bring this out, a launched out attack through the influence of the Antichrist. Now remember, folks, things are going to be incredibly terrible when the Antichrist is in charge on the earth. The Antichrist at first is going to promise peace. He's going to promise prosperity. He's going to be a smooth talker. He's going to be this great personality that everybody can believe in. But this is the promise of the Word of God. Halfway through the tribulation, this guy is going to turn on the people. And Satan is going to use this Antichrist to to go back on his promises. And what he's going to do is he's going to demand worship, and he's going to have the forces of hell unleashed on the earth. So that first thing, when hell is unleashed, a pit is going to be open. The last thing today I want you to see is this. When hell is unleashed, power is going to be given to the demonic forces on the earth. Look at verse 3. It says, Then out of the smoke locusts came up from the earth. These are not just normal locusts. These are demons. We'll talk more about the locusts tonight. But the locusts come upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Have you ever been stung by one of those little scorpions that you can find only in Polk County? They're just little, little baby scorpions. It's really strange that we have them. We're talking about bigger scorpions. Okay, but they were, they were commanded, these scorpions were commanded, or the locusts commanded not to harm the grass of the earth. They, it, it, they were told that, that we don't want you to consume the grass. We don't con- consume the green things or any trees. We want you to consume the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The demons in this text are described as locusts. They're not insects. They're not insects. They're they're, they're described that way because of the number. In 1889, I'm sorry, 1889, one locust swarm reported covered 2,000 square miles. 
We're talking a large number. The image here is this innumerable number of demonic hosts that's being allowed to ascend out of hell onto earth. And there's a couple of reasons that I say that they're not real locusts, and here's why. They don't harm plant life. They torment humans. They have a king, by the way. If you read verse 11, verse 11, they have a king. If you read Proverbs 30, 25, it says locusts don't have a king. Verses 3 through 4, it talks about the power that they possess. These demons are described as locusts, but unlike locusts, they're not going to harm vegeta vegetation. A locust will swarm, uh, and they'll leave, a green, they'll, they'll, they'll leave a green landscape looking like a desert in a very short amount of time. Locusts devour greens. Lo locusts devour leaves. Locusts devour grain, leaving the grain and the, and the stalk. Locusts do not come for the plant life in this text. Locusts are coming for human life. It says they'll have the power to sting like a scorpion. Scorpion stings are known to be very painful. They cause swelling. They cause numbness. They might cause you to pass out, let out a shout, do something that you didn't know you could do. <laughs> but they're rarely fatal. So these demonic beings are allowed out of hell, and they have the power. God has granted them the permission to cause great pain to people. Now, their targets are limited. Notice that they can only harm those who are unsaved. The 144,000, the other believers that are on the earth at the time, are protected from the attacks of hell. That just reminds you and me today. We should be comforted in this, but that should remind you today that even though Satan may be given power, Satan is not in control. <laughs> even when Satan's allowed to do terrible things on the earth, God grants him to do that, and if God doesn't give him permission, he can't do it. <laughs> This last thing, this power will produce pain. This power produces pain. When this attack comes, people are not going to be killed. The Bible says that they will be tormented for five months. Locusts typically, uh, locusts typically are in season, May to September. That's typical lifespan of a locust. These locusts torment for five months. And the pain that is described here, the pain that is described here, it, it's going to be unimaginable. Every moment of every day, there are going to be demons there, and they're going to be tormenting, stinging, causing pain and suffering. And here's the thing. There is no escape. We read that men are going to try to seek every way that they can escape these demons, but nothing is going to help them. There's not going to be any pills, no potions, uh, nothing will work. Alcohol, drugs, they're not going to deaden the pain for five months. They're going to suffer, and they're going to find no relief from their suffering. And, and it goes even further, and it says, in that day when hell is unleashed on the earth, people are going to literally try to kill themselves. They're going to try to take their life. And you know what? In our day, most people try to flee death. They do everything that they can to, to, stop, to, to keep off death. So we go to doctors, and we get on pills, and everything that we go to doctor's appointments, and we try to do everything that we can to extend this life for one more moment but in that day death flees people people typically flee death but in this day death's going to run from people so this is what i imagine i imagine people leaping from buildings trying to crush their bodies on the ground yet they cannot die I imagine in this day people trying to literally drink deadly poisons and kill off their organs and they're not, they're not able to escape. Others may place guns to their heads and attempt to kill themselves, but they will only succeed in adding more misery to their torment. People may try to kill their loved ones to help them escape, but to no avail. For five months, there's not going to be a funeral on the earth. Death will take a holiday. <laughs> While men will endure pain and suffering by this demonic invasion, if this is not a picture of the hell to come, we haven't seen one. And some people may say, well, I don't, I don't think it will happen like that. Read it again, folks. Read it again. In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. I want to close with this. What is this all about? What is this all about? We've talked about the pain that they may bring. We, we talk about where they come from out of the pit. Let's talk about the opportunity, though, that's in this text. The opportunity. I know that 
God is giving the world a taste of what is to come for Judgment Day. I know that God has given them a glimpse of what hell, what hell will be like forever. The reality that God will not allow them to taste death but will taste punishment gives us a clear picture. God is trying to send a message and he's pouring out his full wrath on them. But I want you to notice something. At the same time, at the same time, it appears that God is giving the people that is left on this earth one last time to repent. One last time. The, 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 the 144,000 are still there. There are still Christians on the earth, which means the gospel is still going forth at the time, okay? But, but this only lasts. I want you to keep this in mind. This only lasts for five months. For five months, which means there's a beginning and there's an end. You see what I see here? I see God giving people, even though they're being afflicted and they're being hurt and they're, and they're crying out in pain, even though they're going through the most intense, painful, heart-wrenching, spiritually battered times in their lives, we still see God giving them one more chance. Think about that. Think about that. The world that they loved and worshipped is now destroyed around them. Everything that they once held dear and held to priority now has been devastated by earthquakes and volcanoes and comets and asteroids and, and their waters have been made bloody and their waters have been made bitter and their businesses have crashed and their financial statuses have crashed. Everything that they've ever tried to hold on to as a crutch has been wiped out from underneath them and now their souls, their very souls are being tormented. They're not even allowed to take their own lives to find relief. And all the time, these people have tried to find worship with the Antichrist. They've tried to make perfect world under his leadership just to, just to be turned on by the, by the enemy. There's no escape from this agony except a relationship with Jesus. Why is all of this done? We read this terrible chapter in Scripture and we ask, why is all of this being carried out? Is it just about the wrath of God? I say no. It's not all about the wrath of God. This is also about the peace and redemption and sound salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Remember this, folks. The reason that Christ came and bled and died on the cross for your sins and mine and the reason he arose from the grave three days later is so that we would not spend eternity apart from God, but we would find victory in God. It's so that we could escape this coming judgment. It's so that we could be forgiven of our sin and set free to live as God. God intended us for us to live. Hell was never meant for man. Never meant for man. Hell was meant for the enemy and his, and his demons. But when we see people cast into hell, we realize that people go into hell because they refuse to know Christ. What is Revelation all about? Revelation is all about the unveiling of Jesus so that people would know Jesus. It's not all about the wrath of God. It's about the righteous, good grace of God and the fact that God is still trying to issue this free gift of eternal life even through hell. God is still offering one more chance. One more chance before it's too late. People don't, aren't merely sent to hell. People are sent to hell because they've rejected God. And they've agreed to pay the penalty and price for their sins themselves. When you read this book, you have to be broken. You have to think about the countless lost people that are still going to be on the earth. And you have to think about people that may be in your family, people that may be your friends, people that you may have went out to eat dinner with last night, people that you play ball with, people that you go to school with, people that teach you or people that you teach, people that you work with. Think about the fact that there's so many people that this fate is waiting for them if they don't put their faith in Christ. And the reality is this. One day, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late for those who do not put their faith in Christ. This is just a picture of the hell to come. But it's coming. We who are in Christ today, those of us who are saved, 
We should be moved to share the gospel like we've never shared before. Why? We know the secrets of heaven. We know the secrets of heaven. And here's the thing. God's not giving you a secret to keep. God says, tell my secret. Tell it to everybody. Tell what Christ has done for them. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them that they can have eternal life through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're not meant to keep the secret things of God secret. God wants us to share them. So if you're listening today, I want you to ask yourself this question. As we look at this text, I want you to ask yourself this question. If Christ were to return at this moment... Or if you were to pass, if you were to die today, would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? Would you be rejoicing with the saints? And would you, be, would you, have, would you have the view from the outside looking in? Or would you be awaiting your torment? Think about that. It's life's most important question. Have I ever given my heart to Christ? Think about that as we have read the first part of Revelation 9. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? I'd like to ask if you would to stand today. Can you? Stand. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want, to ask, I want to ask that question again. I want it ringing through your mind and your heart today as we leave this place. Think about it. Ponder on it. If Christ were to return, if your life were to end, would you spend your eternity with Jesus. If you're not sure today, if you're not sure and you say, I've, I've, never, I've never given my heart to Christ. I don't know where I would go. I don't, I don't believe that I would be in heaven. You can know now for sure. You can put your faith and your trust in Jesus alone for salvation. You can sell the eternal things right now. Christ already did 2,000 years ago when he came and he died for your sins, when he arose from the grave, when he offered you forgiveness, redemption, mercy by his blood. You say, Peter, I want that gift today. I, I, I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ for my salvation. If there's a person in the room today that says, today I'm putting my faith in Jesus, would you just lift your hand high? Anybody at all saying, today I'm putting my faith in in Christ. Anybody else? Anybody else today want to know Jesus as Savior? This is your time. This is your opportunity. Don't leave without knowing. Christians, I'm challenging you again today. My heart's, my heart's going out to you. I, I, I can't say it enough. We know where we're headed. <laughs> we, have, we have the grace of God covering us. We have been saved. We have been redeemed. But we have been entrusted with the message of the gospel. I pray today, O oh Lord, that the church would be heavily convicted and moved with compassion on a world that doesn't know Jesus. I pray we would share with our lost friends and our lost co-workers and our family. Let's not wait another day. Let's not say, oh, let's wait till it's convenient or let's wait. Nah. If we know that Christ is returning at any moment, we have to share. We need to share May our lives welcome people to the gospel. May our lips tell people about Christ through the gospel. May we make no, no, have no reservations or no regrets or no excuses. We have the secret things of God in our hearts, in our hands, on the forefronts of our minds. God, stir our souls, convict us to share Jesus like we've never shared him before. Help us to love people. Help us to let them know Christ is coming again. Will you be saved? So God, in this time of invitation today, I just pray for obedience. I pray if people need to come and pray at the altar today that they would feel free to do that. I pray today if somebody wants to give their heart to Jesus Christ that they would come forward. I'd love to minister to them and pray for them and encourage them. If there's a circumstance in their life that they need ministry for, I pray, God, that they would make that known and they would come and they would allow us the chance to pray over them and to help them through this.
May we turn our eyes upon you now in this time. Lord, have your way. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing, I believe, uh, during this invitation time. Just